We will now move on with uh, uh, two other talks and afterwards we will have uh, a discussion. Um, I would like uh, uh, the audience to write any questions that they have to write them in the chat or in the uh, Q&A section and uh, uh, we will try to go through them maybe at the end during the discussion part. Uh, I would also like to ask uh, the speakers, Cassandra, uh, Maria Eugenia and David, if they have time, they're not uh, obliged, but if they can stay until the end and participate in the discussion, discussion with Stephen Scholte and uh, uh, Serena Bonareti, I think this would be great for everybody. So uh, thank you again. Uh, let's uh, uh, move on to our next speaker who is uh, uh, Maria Eugenia Caligiuri. I would, uh, I have a window open with her bio somewhere. Uh, and uh, I know Maria Eugenia because uh, uh, she's very committed to open science. She uh, was uh, in the um, trainee representative in the reproducible research study group of ISMRM. And uh, she's editor of MRM Highlights. Uh, she's currently a postdoc uh, in the Neuroscience Research Center of Magna Grecia University in Catanzaro in Italy. And uh, uh, she um, worked, uh, uh, she has worked, she's working on uh, advanced methods for multimodal MRI and the application towards identification of biomarkers in neurological disorders and healthy brain aging. Uh, thanks to her uh, involvement with the reproducible research, she has a very good uh, gauge on the status of uh, reproducibility in our community. So uh, we are looking forward to her talk. Maria Eugenia, floor. Thank you, Francesco, for the presentation and for the invitation. And good luck with the rest of the workshop. Can you see my slides? OK. So uh, I have no uh, nothing to disclose. So the, the first time I, I faced uh, practically the, the reproducibility crisis in MRI was when we were organizing the, uh, the workshop with the reproducible research study group of ISMRM on open science and reproducibility. And I read this interesting editorial by Stikov and, uh, and others where they, they clearly stated that our, uh, our field is experiencing, as also Cassandra said, a, a reproducibility crisis mainly because our world is uh, heavily driven by intellectual property and uh, vendor related solutions, but also because, uh, as also Cassandra said, because of poor statistical practices and um, the culture of publish and perish. But the, the main point is that um, without reproducibility, we cannot aim to uh, reach the identification of reliable biomarkers for disease and for healthy aging. So MRI measures will remain um, not reliable for clinical trials or for monitoring the, the disease and understanding what happens in disorders such as the neurological ones where we, we really cannot um, say how the, the patient will answer to a, to a drug or how it's, his or her disease will, uh, will progress from the start. So here is an overview of, of what I will present you briefly, that there's so much to say on each of these, um, of these uh, aspects. Okay, let me change this. Well, reproducibility across the MRI pipeline starts with acquisition and reconstruction, but affects also very heavily data modeling and results interpretation. This second part was uh, very well covered by Cassandra with, with, with very good examples. So I will probably dwell most on this first, first, first part. The main sources of variability when we acquire MRI data ca can be some of them can be changed by the investigator, but others cannot. For example, we cannot choose scanner vendor model. Uh, we, can, we, we don't have a word on uh, when the scanner hardware and software are updated. And, and this can heavily impact the, uh, the results of data acquisition and of reconstruction. Things we can act on if we have access to, to the protocol, to the MRI protocol, are the acquisition type and the sequence parameters. But even then, 
the liberty of the single investigator is not uh, completely is not complete regarding this thing. A possible solution, which we will see uh, later on, is using quantitative MRI. Uh, so um, where we, we, we go to measure property of interest from a um, quantitative point of view, so that image interpretation is not only anatomical, but also numerical. Quantitative MRI, we'll see, can be done only if accurate calibration is performed. From the point of view, instead of data modeling and uh, results interpretation, there are several aspects that um, hamper reproducibility from the choice of post-processing softwares and uh, how, on what workstations we run them and on the choice of the statistical framework, either uh, by traditional approaches or by more advanced techniques such as machine learning. And as, mm, as we previously see, uh, there are many, many sources of variability here. And it, it would be very hard to explore all of them in a single study. So this, is, mm, this un underlines the importance of uh, sharing data and code where available. Let's see an example of um, how acquisition type and modeling severely affect the um, data interpretation and, and anyway, data extraction. For example, in diffusion MRI, uh, we have several schemes that, we, several acquisition schemes that we can use to acquire data. Each of them has its pros and cons and the more sophisticated the acquisition scheme becomes the more uh, accurate is the description of the, of the diffusion process. But the point is, how can we merge all this data coming from different uh, acquisitions if uh, after we, we choose which one is better in our center? It is not very easy to merge everything in a single study, but this is becoming more and more needed because only by um, including data from several centers, we can gain, we can reach the statistical power, power needed to detect even subtle changes in the, in the tissue, in, in tissue properties. So for example, when we deal with different acquisition type and modeling, we have to remember that data can be eventually merged, but using harmonization techniques in an appropriate way. Going to QMRI, I, I am very fond of quantitative MRI, and uh, this is because I, I think it, it really points toward uh, achieving measurement of, of tissue properties that can be replicated across sites and uh, uh, even on the, on the same subject at different points of view. Mm, as I said before, stability of QMRI is guaranteed only if we can design an appropriate quality control protocol that helps us to uh, assess that our measurements are good. As any measurement, as any scientific measurement, we have to exclude or anyway limit the possibility of systematic errors and other types of measurement errors. The, one of the, the, the main advantages of QMRI is that if we can um, use identical acquisition sequences on the same, in this study from Grassi and et al, you can see that they use uh, different scanners, but with the same acquisition sequences, the, the variability, the variation in the scanner scan, but also in the, in the inter-scanner uh, acquisition were very low. And, and this, is not, um, this is not easy to, to achieve without quantitative MRI. Also important is the work by Katie Keenan and, and their group at NIST, where they, they highlighted the, the need for uh, the use of phantoms and reference objects to guarantee that our measurements 
really um, are really repeatable and really represent the the biological properties that are of interest. For example, T1 and T2 relaxation time. So for for carrying out an, a quantitative MRI analysis, we need phantoms. We need these uh, these items made of different materials, including plastics, uh, solutions, uh, different solutions that uh, somehow um, try to represent the, the different properties that we can find in the, in the tissues of interest. There are many phantoms that uh, available. One has to, a researcher has to be careful to, to choose the, the right phantom for his or her application. And uh, what we do is we, we put the phantom in the scanner and we acquire either on the, on the same day or on different days or on different scanners and sites, we acquire the measurements from the phantoms and we compare it with the ground truth. This is very good because it assesses quality of the acquired data. It allows um, um, an objective assessment of intrascanner and interscanner variability without problems of subject positioning or other individual difference that could, uh, that could hamper the, the, the reproducibility. It, it can also, the, the use of phantoms can also detect some problems, hardware of, or software problems that might not be alighted by, by the system, uh, such as systematic uh, measurements, errors, and, uh, and shifts. Uh, when we are planning, if we should plan a, a multi-site clinical trials, phantoms would be um, inevitable, inevitable uh, steps to qualificate a site or not for uh, acquisition of data. What's the bad side? What, what's the, the cons of using phantoms? The calibration process has to be uh, carried out carefully. And this can be a problem, especially in clinical settings where there might be no time to, to carry out the process. There is the need for, for an expertise. Someone needs to know how to calibrate the, the machine and, and not every clinical center might have someone always on site to do this. And the, from a technical point of view, not every phantom might perfectly represent the, the in vivo imaging situation that we want to describe. Um, always in the context of calibration, system upgrades, not only hardware, but also software, have to be uh, carefully taken into account as the system might be needed to be uh, calibrated again. Another issue in reproducibility is that the choice of post-processing method, even if we choose also always the same, um, Cassandra showed how in fMRI, different softwares yield very different results on single subjects. But also if we choose to use the, always the same, um, same software and, and all its tools, we have to be careful to its updates and upgrades. Usually, as we can see from these uh, free surfer release notes, usually it is the, um, the developers that advise us if data from previous versions can be mixed with data processed with the new, with the new version. But sometimes due to uh, developers seeing that maybe data is, um, is processed in, in different ways, developers advise not to merge data. So sometimes it might be needed to reprocess all our data sets with a new release of the software. Another, um, another issue with the, pro the post-processing software is the, the type of workstation, the operative system, on which they are run. They might be compatible with different, uh, uh, with different versions, such as, um, and different packages. We, they could be uh, um, compatible with uh, Macintosh or either with Debian and Unix, but different version, different updates of the operative system can affect uh, the results of each stage of the, um, 
of the processing pipeline. One of the main um, causes of this are the, the updates of the library that, um, that deal with the mathematical function of manipulating uh, floating point numbers. This can change and, and the result is that while single steps cannot, might be uh, quite repeatable, the, more, the longer is the pipeline, the, um, the more errors accumulate. So if we just um, segment a structure, the, the differences might not be the, that, that great, but if we have a, a processing pipeline from uh, brain extraction, for example, to um, resting state uh, ICA, we, we will see of, of always greater differences, even if we process the same data set with an updated uh, operative system. Um, from these two studies, the main conclusion is that it, is, it would be better not to um, update the, neither the software or the operating system, or if, if you have to do it, you should always rerun the analysis to be sure that your results can be, um, can be kept uh, or anyway are reliable. But here we go into the, the, the multiverse analysis that Cassandra was, uh, was speaking of. It might not be always possible to explore all possible uh, situations. After post-processing is done, the, the main uh, issue that, that I also encounter during, during my everyday work is issue, issues with statistical reproducibility. Um, I actively review for several journals and what I see not only in my group, but also in, uh, in the papers I, I get to review is that uh, very often there's, there's, there's a poor statistical framework, there's a poor statistical design. Um, the study court might not be uh, appropriate, balanced for, for the study. Of course, this, this depends on, um, on the application, on the hypothesis, but uh, in this era, where reproducibility is a problem, researchers should aim for multi-center studies, even if the, um, the question is simple and, and it may seem that could be answered on a few patients. This, is not, this might not be always the case. Statistical assumptions are almost always not met so uh, going back to what Cassandra showed about poor peer review, peer reviewers should be very, very um, careful to underlining these, these situations because publishing um, a work where data is analyzed with uh, a, a wrong statistical method can, can very much uh, hamper the, the validity also of studies that will read that, that research and, uh, and try to replicate its result. Uh, one thing I also noticed is the wild use of complex approaches to, um, to data sets that, that might not support that. So maybe deep learning and neural networks applied to data set of uh, uh, tens of patients um, were probably the, the, only, the only thing that will be correctly done is overfit the, the data set. And um, one thing that, I, that I, I always look at when I review a paper is the, the use of strategies for correction of multiple comparisons. This is often either underestimated by authors, always for the published or perished, um, practices and, uh, and the fact that it is hard to publish negative results rather than positive results. So the, the, the possible solutions to these poor practices are, as I said, multi-center studies, but also a more, more careful choice of the statistical methods that is, a, that is more appropriate for our sample comparisons of different approaches as Cassandra showed by, by exploring the branches of, of a tree where possible, 
always because we cannot explore each single solution. But what each of us can do really is share the code and where available the data, but data is under uh, privacy regulation and is harder. Share the code when you do an analysis. Don't be afraid that someone might um, highlight bugs and uh, mistakes in your code. This will only get it better and get better results. And then validation is needed, especially in clinical studies. We need to validate and mm, replicate the results on different courts, on independent courts, independently of the, of the study sample characteristics. Here, for example, is um, a meta-analysis on the results of iron mapping in the Substantia nigra, a, a structure that is mainly involved in patients with Parkinson's disease. Here, authors uh, compared how different techniques, this kind of sums up all the, the MRI pipeline uh, stages, different acquisition schemes for uh, iron mapping, quantitative susceptibility mapping, uh, susceptibility, susceptibility weighted imaging, and uh, R2 star relaxometry, all yield in some way results that suggested uh, iron accumulation in the substantia nigra, but with different degrees of reproducibility across, across uh, different, um, different studies. So Parkinson's disease, which is not detectable until clinical symptoms are, are visible, but the brain damage is already very, very uh, severe at that time. Mm, diseases like that can really um, take advantage from quantitative uh, MRI that can be reproducible across different patients all around the world and to identify biomarkers that really can tell us this person might be at risk of, de of developing the disease or this person is at risk of not responding to drugs, etc. Um, to conclude, these are some initiatives in the field of reproducible research that I am particularly uh, I particularly care about. One is, of course, all the, the initiatives from ISMRM's uh, reproducible research and quantitative MRI study groups. Um, I invite you to look at the reprodu reproducible uh, research insights, which are um, always um, taken, um, an initiative taken by Matthew Baudreau on the online part of MRM highlights. Here you will see some, uh, some papers and some Q&A with the authors of papers who choose to uh, share their data, share their code, sorry, not the data. And, um, and, and you can see how, how this uh, positively impacted their work. Another uh, initiative is a um, special issue in Physica Medica towards quantitative MRI in clinical settings. So if you are interested in uh, performing an experiment with trying to, which tries to reproduce clinical findings, uh, you can have a look at it. This is a um, sum up slide. So what I believe is good uh, in, in MRI regarding reproducibility is that there, there is a growing interest uh, towards quantitative MRI measurements and that um, many and many groups control, uh, appropriately control the, the quality of their data, designing appropriate pipelines. Uh, there is also a growing interest in sharing code and data, also always taking into account privacy regulation. And um, one thing we all should uh, do an effort towards is foster reproducibilities of studies. Also, in, independently from what uh, a journal would publish because mm, what I experience is uh, the editor will desk reject my paper because I'm I'm not uh, providing positive results or I am not reproducing uh, results from previous papers. But those papers might might not um, have shared their code. So it is good to um, to challenge also existing literature. And, and confront with, with other researchers. 
um, the bad, what we don't always do. Mm, we don't always pay attention to the aspects upon which we could act mm, because this requires time and resources, not only money resources, but also human resources. We have to face the, um, the problem of finding a trade-off between image quality and uh, time and acquisition time in clinical practice. And the clinical practice is where we really can get the data from the patients. Otherwise, in the research centers, we will always be limited by the, the numerosity of the study sample. And uh, then there is the impossibility of action by uh, researchers upon the, the system upgrades, probably due to intellectual property um, and, uh, and other aspects. So thank you. I believe this slide. Thank you very much, Maria Eugenia. Uh, this was a really nice overview of the situation in our field. Again, we will explore this uh, in uh, the coming uh, sessions.